Now it's my pleasure to introduce the next uh, speaker, Professor Kevin Tan, who is the President of the International Council on Monuments and Sites. He is an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Law at National University of Singapore and also holds an appointment here at NTU in the <coughs> Raja Ratnam School for International Studies. He has written many books and edited books on law, history and politics of Singapore and for <coughs> almost a decade he has also been the president of the Singapore Heritage Society. Professor Tan. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, let me thank um, the uh, organizers for having me here at this conference. Uh, it's a great pleasure. I'm not quite sure uh, how uh, my presentation will fit into this whole discussion on complexity. In fact, I'm going to uh, argue that it is complexity that will probably suffer as a consequence of what we might try to do with intangible cultural heritage in Singapore. So I've entitled my talk, Identity and Identification. And uh, this basically addresses the problematics of uh, trying to protect uh, intangible cultural heritage in Singapore. I will take, uh, since my background really is in law, I will take a fairly legal uh, approach to it and basically uh, argue that uh, such an approach might not perhaps be the best thing uh, and, and why it might not work in so far as heritage is concerned. Now, attempts to safeguard various aspects of um, heritage uh, through law have been made since the 1950s. Um, the picture you see here, of course, is the Aswan High Dam. And uh, this was a project uh, started in 1954 and uh, took you know, something like 15 years to complete. But when they were building this dam, um, the, one of the big problems was to how to safeguard the cultural treasures of ancient Egypt in Nubia. And this was when Egypt and also Sudan actually put out a plea to the international community to see how uh, these treasures could be saved. Um, a lot of money was raised at that time, $80 million US dollars was a lot of money and this was raised uh, effectively to move um, many of these um, monumental statue, cultural uh, treasures for th who, who, who are thousands of years old, uh, piece by piece, rock by rock, away from the uh, dam, dam site as well as uh, away from where the, the, um, the water would actually accumulate and move them, all right, uh, some ways down uh, the, the river. Now, so since that time, um, the idea has emerged that there are aspects of heritage that are not just national in nature, they are international, they transcend borders. So um, the Aswan Dam project was one good example of how uh, these ancient treasures were not only treasures to the Egyptians and the Sudanese, but also to the world at large. They belong sort of to the idea of a common heritage of mankind and not, you know, uh, things that could be decided purely on their own, not subject only to state imperatives and agendas. And so um, efforts from that time have been uh, ongoing to see how the international community can safeguard these cultural treasures and prevent them from being destroyed willy-nilly by states, especially in their rush uh, to uh, modernization and development. Um, so... The first target, of course, is built heritage. And built heritage is, in a way, an easy target because, well, we can see it. So these are, for example, the uh, pictures of the giant um, um, statues that were moved uh, during the um, Aswan Dam project. Uh, and eventually, um, a number of uh, conferences, a number of calls were made worldwide to see what the international community can collectively do to safeguard these uh, cultural treasures. In 1965, there was a White House conference calling for a World Heritage Trust, uh, calling for the preservation of, quote, world's superb natural and scenic areas and historic sites for the present and future of the entire world citizenry. And basically talking about protecting this for not just for this generation, but for future generations to come. Uh, here was uh, both a a uh, combination of what you call natural heritage sites, uh, scenic sites, as well as 
you know, built heritage uh, that, that they were concerned about. In 1968, uh, the uh, International Union on Conservation of Nature, IUCN, uh, came out with similar proposals. And of course, this in the end culminated in a convention concerning the protection of world cultural and natural heritage in 1972, which we, we now have and which Singapore is now part of. Now, I raised these issues relating uh, and this very potted history of how uh, the world and the international community has come together to talk about uh, protecting heritage because they have cho chosen the instrumentality of the law to do it. In other words, rather than simply you know, work on, say, a bilateral basis or even a multilateral basis on sort of generalities and sort of you know, gentlemen's understandings and so on, they have chosen the law as an instrument, as, as a platform for this kind of a protection. And this is where things get a little bit complicated because once you start choosing law as your platform, then you are beginning to see uh, the nature of law taking over and where the problems are likely to arise. So, um, let's talk about uh, something that's not uh, so tangible, not so easy to target, not so easy to identify as built heritage. I think uh, in terms of built heritage, um, uh, you, you know, because it's there, it's physical, it's been around. I mean, you can look at a place, you can look at a statue and you know it's been around for 4,000 years. It's, it's been around. Uh, it's not the same with something a little bit more intangible, ideas, culture, and so on and so forth. Nonetheless, it did not uh, prevent the international community from still trying in some way to safeguard these. So in 1954, for example, the UNESCO uh, came up with a convention for the protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict. This is, of course, uh, uh, the fear uh, that in the event of armed conflicts, you, did, you didn't want some of these national uh, or international treasures to be destroyed. Um, this idea, of course, is nothing uh, really new. If any of you have read the book or watched the movie Monuments Men, you would know that in the aftermath of the or towards the, the end phases of the Second World War, um, uh, the US, for example, had a core of Monuments Men, military uh, um, uh, personnel who were trained uh, in you know, fine arts, in um, curatorialship, uh, and, and so on, uh, helping to safeguard, you know, uh, cultural treasures, built heritage, uh, and even you know, things like paintings and so on uh, from the um, fallout effects of armed conflict. Um, subsequent to the UNESCO Convention in 1954, there were in fact three other major recommendations that were adopted at the UN General Assembly. One relating to the accessibility to museums, 1960. Another one on safeguarding the beauty of landscapes and sites. Right? This is, as you can see, in sort of parallel uh, with the American Initiative, uh, 1962. And finally, preserving cultural property endangered by public or private works. This is uh, sort of the developmental thing, the Aswan Dam type of situation. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, uh, this, the, the, while this was going on, sort of the UN, UNESCO site, uh, you also had in Asia uh, uh, in 2000 an ASEAN Declaration on Cultural Heritage, okay, which I will come to uh, in a while. And, and this, in fact, predated the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage that is sort of the main uh, instrument that we, we, are, we, we tend to look to today. Um, 163 states are actually parties to the UN Convention for Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, which is quite phenomenal. In other words, there are only maybe about 30 other states, that, including Singapore, who are not parties to this particular um, um, convention. What is the impact? Why, why, why do these numbers matter? Because in international law, um, when, we, when you have a large number of states actually acceding to or agreeing to a particular set of norms, a particular set of rules, uh, they even attain, uh, attain a level beyond the convention. In other words, if it can be shown that some of the provisions in the convention have attained something which we call customary international law level, then even if you are not a party to the convention, the convention could apply to you because it codifies these sort of general principles and norms. And in a way, it's a bit of a numbers game. So if you've got 163 states in the world that actually agree to it, then uh, I think the, the argument could be pretty strong to say that 
um, you know, it, it may be close to attaining, uh, you know, possibly uh, the status of customary international law, which means, in case of Singapore, it might apply to Singapore even if we didn't sign it. Uh, I leave that to uh, uh, this discussion aside because, you know, that's not something uh, that, that we uh, uh, should be going into, but I just wanted to alert you all to the, the fact that numbers do matter in international law. Now, once you start looking at that convention, the 2003 convention, uh, you, you, you then have uh, a number of uh, criteria, a number of things that you need to do. And the legal protection, once you talk about it in protection in terms of law, requires two things. The first, the identification of this cultural heritage. What are these elements? Who gets to identify them? Right? How do you identify them? How do you actually... Uh, figure out what is it that you want to protect. That's the first question. And the second one is, once you've identified, assuming it is unproblematic, assuming that you can in fact identify it, then uh, how are you going to protect it? What else needs to be done? So I've listed five questions here. Number one, who gets to identify what is intangible cultural heritage in Singapore? Who are the communities referred to? in the convention, insofar as Singapore is concerned, because uh, the convention sort of talks about communities self-identifying who they are to begin with, and then identifying the intangible cultural heritage in respect of that community. So I first got to decide who my community is. So let's say you're a Peranakan or you claim to be a Peranakan. We are assuming that the categorization of Peranakans is unproblematic. It is not. Right? And then assuming that you actually know who the Peranakans are, then uh, what constitutes Peranakan intangible cultural heritage? Uh, that is the question. Right? So I'll come to, back to, to sort of giving you some thoughts on these questions uh, at the end of my presentation. How do we determine the elements of heritage to be protected? And a very important thing, right? if, if the convention calls for states to do things, there's a cost to it. So the question is, who bears the cost? Does the state bear the cost? Does or do the communities who want to preserve their cultural, intangible cultural heritage bear the trust, the, the, the cost? Should the international community bear the cost? This, this is a very, very big question because if we don't answer and we cannot answer this question, then uh, really uh, the, the enforcement mechanism or the enforcement rules within the convention are not worth the paper they are written on. Finally, you know, uh, how does local heritage become important globally? And this is a very interesting uh, dilemma in a sense because while the convention talks about heritage, culture, intangible her cultural heritage that is identified by local community and local groups, uh, they must be of sufficient importance to be able to make it into the protected list or the list that the convention envisages. But let's leave the 2003 convention momentarily and see what we have uh, been looking at in ASEAN. Now, in the case of the ASEAN Declaration on Cultural Heritage, um, I'm afraid it's a little bit wordy, but I, I, I felt it's important to uh, highlight some of these uh, provisions in there. First of all, as an instrument, a declaration is not law. Declaration is merely an aspirational document stating what the states collectively hope to do, hope to uh, aspire to and what they, they, they would do. And you will notice that the phraseology generally is not so, uh, not, not so didactic, it's not so mandatory, it doesn't require states to you know, take steps to do certain things. But nonetheless, uh, they do offer some definitional issues here. For example, under the ASEAN Declaration on Cultural Heritage, uh, cultural heritage is defined as a number of things. Number one, um, significant cultural values and concepts, right? not something you can touch. Structures, artifacts, dwellings, buildings for worship, utility structures, works of visual arts, tools and implements that are of historical, aesthetic or scientific significance. That's easy. That's quite easy. You can find them, you can uh, look at them, you can touch them, you can argue about them. Sites and human habitats, human creations or combined human creations and nature, archaeological sites, sites of living human communities that are of outstanding value from a historical, aesthetic, anthropological or ecological viewpoint or because of its natural features 
of considerable importance as habitat for the cultural survival and identity of particular living traditions. Now here you're getting into more problematic territory. Some things you can identify quite clearly, archaeological sites you can identify, but what about organic sites that continue to be important? What about places that have been, un ha have been inhabited sort of in the same way for the last thousand years, for example? Now that's another problematic. Um, not only that, the uh, definition of cultural heritage uh, says that this intangible cultural heritage is transmitted from generation to generation, is constantly recreated by communities and groups in response to the environment, interaction with nature and their history, provides them with a sense of identity and continuity, thus promoting respect for cultural diversity and human creativity. Now, the ASEAN Declaration has more. Okay? Uh, they talk about oral or folk heritage, folkways, folklore, languages and literature, traditional arts and crafts, architecture, and performing arts, games, indigenous knowledge, systems and practices, myths, customs and beliefs, rituals and other living traditions. We're getting into really contentious, difficult territory. Written heritage, that's a little bit easier, right? Because you can see it, you can identify it. Popular cultural heritage, this is really problematic. Popular creativity in mass cultures, that is, industrial or commercial cultures. Popular forms of expression of outstanding aesthetic, anthropological and sociological values, including music, dance, graphic arts, fashion, games and sports. Industrial design, cinema, television, music videos, video arts and cyber art in technologically oriented urbanized communities. This sounds like Singapore put it in. Uh, right? Um, interesting, right? But, but, but if you have a definition that is so broad, how are we uh, able to actually protect it? Okay. The picture here, of course, uh, is, is actually a performance of uh, Gura Kapung in Singapore. It's the famously known as the horse dance. Very problematic. Uh, in terms of identification, whether it is part of Singapore's cultural heritage or not, if indeed you know it is, uh, the Kura Kupang comes from Java. It predates the Islamic era, which means that there are animist aspects to the dance. Uh, the dancers go into a trance. They sometimes eat glass. They get whipped, uh, and but it's an intrinsic part of sort of our tradition. I I, I remember distinctly. Uh, one time when I took uh, some tourist friends of mine uh, to the Malay Cultural Center, the Malay, yeah, which is now no more, it's been demolished. And during his last days, on, on weekends, you would see Koda uh, uh performances there. They would be singing, there would be horse, uh, these, these horse dancers, and you would see people go into a trance and eat glass and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and what I noticed, of course, was uh, beyond the fact that you know it was really crowded. Uh, much of the crowd was, in some sense, uh, you know, quite young. They were in their thirties, uh, even younger. Uh, and I, I, I saw this uh, young Malay chap next to me. He was in his thirties. So you know, I smiled at him. I said, "Hey, um, this is interesting." He said, "Yeah, this is really, really interesting." I said, "So uh, you're Malay?" He says, "Yes, I'm Malay." You're Muslim, yes, you're Muslim. I say, you know, in this sort of Malay-Muslim uh, identity, this one, uh, not haram. Is, in other words, is this not forbidden, right? Because it's got this animist aspects to it. And he gave me an answer that was very interesting and, and, uh, and shows the complexity of identity here. He looked at me, he said, ah, never mind, uh, tonight we are Malays. Uh. So, in other words, he's chosen to, to go to the sort of the ethnological route for identity that evening rather than his sort of religious route for identity. And so he said, oh, tonight we are, we are Malays. Ah, never mind. Uh, you know, and then, of course, he, he, he went back with his friends to en en enjoying the performance. So, uh, this just goes to show you the, some of the complexities in identifying what these cultural, intangible cultural heritage uh, uh, elements are. Now let's come to the main convention itself. Here uh, it, it is less problematically defined but still problematically defined. Intangible cultural heritage here is defined as 
practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, skills, as well as the instruments, objects, artifacts, and cultural spaces associated therewith that communities, groups, and in some cases, individuals recognised as part of their cultural heritage. I want to highlight this particularly because here it's not just talking about any kind of representation or expression. It is linked directly to communities, groups, and in some cases, certain individuals. Who are these communities? Who are these groups and who, goodness, are these individuals who are the ones who can determine what elements of their cultural heritage are important enough that require some kind of protection uh, uh, it, it, under this convention? The... Uh, I've already talked about the, the general idea that cultural heritage transmits from generation to generation and in a way is somehow organic to that community. So, number one, you've got to find out who the community is. It is necessarily self-identifying because you've got to say, well, I am a member of this particular community. And in the case of uh, my young Malay uh, acquaintance, the knight at the uh, Gelang, he, he chose to be Malay for the night. That's identification. So is it unproblematic or do we all actually have multiple identities under which we then uh, assume you know, stewardship, custodianship over some of these elements of cultural, intangible cultural heritage? Um, for the purposes of convention, it says, uh, consideration will be given solely to such intangible cultural heritage as, in, as is compatible with existing international human rights instruments. I think this is, this is quite important because obviously, um, I think um, the drafters of the conventions were quite clear they didn't want to have you know, uh, culture, you know, what passes for intangible cultural heritage that may require, I don't know, bloodletting and human sacrifice and that sort of stuff, right? Um, as well as requirements for mutual respects amongst communities, groups, individuals, and of sustainable development. Now, what are then, assuming you can identify these things, what do you need to do under this convention? Well, you need to safeguard it. And what does that mean? Measures aim at ensuring the viability of the intangible cultural heritage, including identification, documentation, research, preservation, protection, promotion, enhancement, transmission, particularly through formal and non-formal education, as well as revitalization of the various aspects of such heritage. This is what safeguarding is required. And so, under Article 11, it says each state party, all these 163 states, say that they will take the necessary measures to ensure that these, the intangible cultural heritage in its territory will be safeguarded. That's a very tall order, right? Then, among the safeguarding measures referred to in Article 2, Paragraph 3, which is what I've just read you just now, you are expected to also identify and define the various elements of the intangible cultural heritage present in your territory with the participation of communities, groups, and relevant NGOs. Now, this is... I don't know if these states that have signed on to the convention realise what an onerous task they have actually set themselves up for. But when you talk about safeguarding, requiring you to do things like documentation, research, preservation, uh, protection, and so on, that costs money. That costs resources. How are you actually going to, to prioritize and privilege this? At the same time, not only are you documenting, keeping for prosperity in some kind of recorded form, you're expected to, through the process of formal and informal, non-formal education, revitalize some aspects. So what do you revitalize and what do you, what do you not revitalize? If there are in your territory only the last three speakers of a particular language, and that language is going to be gone once these three guys die, do you then have a duty to the world, since you sign on to an international convention, to then document it and then continue to uh, run lessons in this particular language so that you can keep it alive? This is something that is very, very contentious. Not only that, Article 12 requires you to have inventories. You must identify with a view to safeguarding uh, and draw up an inventory geared 
to your own situation uh, of the intangible cultural heritage present. When each state party periodically submits its report to the committee, it shall provide relevant information on these inventories. So again, which body puts this in place? Is this the state's job? Or is it the self-identifying communities who are trying to safeguard their intangible cultural heritage that have a duty to do this? If so, where is going to be the wherewithal to do it? The money, the funds, the expertise, and so on. Um, Article 13. Um, other measures for safeguarding, adopting general policy aim at promoting the function of intangible cultural heritage, designating or establishing one or more competent bodies to safeguard heritage, like setting up an organisation, maybe something like the NH, uh, NHB, foster scientific, technical and artistic studies, as well as research methodologies with a view to effective safeguarding of intangible heritage, adopting appropriate legal, technical, administrative, financial measures aimed at um, fostering the creation, strengthening of institutions, uh, access to the intangible cultural heritage and uh, documentation in, uh, institutions. Right? Quite, quite a mouthful, quite a lot to do. Uh, and finally, uh, not, not finally, um, Article 14, education and awareness, raising and capacity building. Right? Uh, you know, all these things requiring a lot of resources. And finally, the participation of communities, uh, groups and individuals in uh, the, the, the safeguarding framework. So let me return, and my time is, is coming to a close, so I will return to the questions that were posed earlier, which is the legal protection requiring two things. Number one, identification of elements of intangible cultural heritage. Number two, how do we protect them through laws and programs who identifies? And let's, let's try and answer these questions in relation to Singapore. One of the things that you will, the first question will be who gets to identify? And in the case of Singapore, uh, in a way, it becomes even more complex than in many societies. And I'm not saying Singapore is unique, but for a very small place like Singapore, uh, you've got you know, uh, multiple ethnicities, you've got four, you've got three sort of major ethnic groups in Singapore, you've got many uh, major religions that are being practiced in Singapore. Not only that, you know, people have very differing histories uh, in, in Singapore. How do we identify first the community that would make this identification possible? And I start with something that we celebrate. We kind of forgot all about it, but we began celebrating it you know, maybe 20 years ago, and then with uh, the TV series Little Nonya became much more celebrated, which is the Peranakan. Who are the Peranakans? Um, when I was growing up, my mother always told me that we are Peranakans. So I, I of course, I <clears throat> took that as a truism and <coughs> as a given, and I so accepted it. And then when I started reading around about Peranakans, you know, uh, the ethnographical origins of uh, Peranakans, uh, you, you have them uh, as Chinese males generally coming from China in one of the uh, immigration uh, moves, you know, dating back from the 17th century onwards, uh, intermarrying with local women. So I said, hey, um, so there must be someone, you know, some Malay grandmother, great-grandmother somewhere along the line. So I, I asked my mother, I said, hey, you know, who, who, so who's the Malay in our family? And she said, no, la, there are no Malays in the family. Then I said, then technically speaking, we are not Pranakans. She said, of course we are Pranakans. Well, there's one thing you learn about being a son of a Pranakan woman is, number one, you never quarrel with a Pranakan woman. <laughs> right? And you don't question your mother. But anyhow, <laughs> it is problematic, right? Because when you start asking the question further, right, how is it that we are Puranakans? In, in, in another time when she was in a better mood, she said, well, we are Puranakans because we are straits born. We have been in the straits for over 100 years. And then, of course, she starts rattling off our relatives' names and you know, great-grandfathers and whatnot. So the fact that you've been in the straits can't speak Chinese, speak a bit of Hokkien and Malay and, of course, English. Uh, 
Does that make you Peranakan? Well, technically speaking, maybe not. But then if you want to claim to be Peranakan, who am I to stop you from claiming that you are a Peranakan? So if you want to claim yourself to be a Peranakan, then, then okay, uh, I self-identify. Okay. How does it make me a Peranakan? Must I be able to speak Malay? My Malay is quite bad. Does it mean I'm not really a Peranakan? Must I be able to eat, I don't know, uh, ayam buah keluar? I know my mother doesn't, she hates ayam bakula. Uh, so does that make you not a Peranakan anymore? Um, does it mean that you must join the Peranakan Association? Now, I, I'm just throwing these things out because th this is very, very problematic. Now, assuming that they can find themselves and organize themselves and unproblematically state that they are, in fact, the Peranakans, then okay. Um, they are the communities. Now, who among the community gets to decide what aspects of Peranakan culture uh, are important, intangible? Okay, I mean, let's not talk about furniture, let's not talk about you know paintings and all that. Those are tangible stuff that you know. But what about the intangibles? You know, uh, what about you know the the the, the patois? Do you must you be able to replicate this, right? Uh, is, is this part and parcel of your Peranakan uh, culture and so on. So that is a big problem. Next, elements. How do we actually identify the elements? Um, so this are, these are problems for the community because the community needs first to self-identify and secondly, once they have identified themselves, decide you know, how in the world they are going to assert that community. Now, there are in each of us a multiplicity of identities. So, I can claim to be a Peranakan. I can also claim to be ethnic Chinese since my mother said there's no Malay in the family. Uh, I can also claim to be a Singaporean, right? So, chili crab was not invented by Peranakans, that's for sure. Is it a Singapore dish? I also want to claim that it's part of my heritage, Right? So it's a problematic. So how then do I claim this? You know, should I get incensed when the Malaysian um, culture minister starts to claim chicken rice and chili crab and everything else under the sun? Um, then I come to this question. Who is going to pay for it? Let's say I can identify. Let's say we all Peranakans need to be able to speak Peranakan Patois, curse like a Peranakan. Uh, oh, it's very, very colourful one. I can tell you that. Um, uh, who's going to pay for it? Do we pay for it? Do we engage our own teachers? Do we, you know, or do we expect the state to pay for it? Because this is an intrinsic part of our identity within this territory. Okay, and the moment you start asking this question, then I'm afraid we have to bring the state into the picture here. What is the role of the state in determining what these things are? Now, as far as the state is concerned. The state has its own agenda and quite, quite different agendas from those of the constituent communities in Singapore. Because states, generally in the nation-making enterprise, are not very happy or not very comfortable with difference. They are looking for commonalities because that's what builds a nation. You want to build on commonalities. And that's why when the state gets into the picture, you will notice that they kind of talk about things that everyone can identify with, like speaking Singlish, for example. right? Chicken rice, for example. Food, not as contentious perhaps as some other aspects like rituals and so on. Um, so the state has its own agenda. And when the state is brought into the picture, if you want the state to do all the things that the convention requires, uh, set up depositories, do recording, documentation, not only that, run formal and non-formal education pro programs to further those particular elements of your intangible cultural heritage, then what do you need? You need them to buy into the agenda. And here is where the states will inev inevitably try to, to strive for common ground because you can't uh, 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 find a way. I mean, it's very hard for the state to step in and then create friction. So you try and find something that's common ground that everybody kind of agree, agrees on. But the moment you ask the state to do more, you want more funds, you want to do more education programs and so on, there are only two grounds, two ways you can drag the state into the picture. Number one, 
is if there's a commercial angle to it. Intangible heritage, maybe knowledge about you know, botanical cures and so on. Ah, those things may be commercially viable. We might be able to bring in A-star, you know, guys like that, bring into the picture, protect it in some way, exploit it, and then the state, of course, uh, stands to benefit. But the other one, beyond the dollars and cents question, that the state has realized is very important of late, in the last, I would say, 20 years, is that it inculcates a sense of rootedness in the state. There was a time where everyone was talking about uh, going abroad, having a second wing, and Singaporeans began to say, hey, if I can live elsewhere, I can live in Singapore, I can live anywhere around the world, what's the difference, right? Why do you need to go back to Singapore? And that's when the government began to worry. Immigration, uh, emigration out of Singapore, and then you know fear that you you lose the so-called Singapore core. So you will find that even in the last two general elections, there's a lot of talk about the Singaporean core, that particular identity, which the state has a very very high interest in maintaining. But in the maintenance of this particular agenda, the question then is, you know, what does it do in relation to uh, the various different variegated, heterogeneous communities. Is, will this become you know, something that's essentialized about your particular uh, culture? Is it reduced in some way to something that is available for mass consumption? My final point about this is that once you have these criteria listed out in the form of a law, law is a very, very blunt instrument with which to protect anything. Once you put something into law, it solidifies positions. You're either legal or illegal. You either do it right or you do it wrong. And this does not afford much room for negotiation between the state and the communities in determining uh, what local heritage and what local elements of intangible cultural heritage needs protection. And I suggest that perhaps it is best for us uh, to avoid the law and maybe stay out of the convention and uh, mutually and uh, democratically, hopefully, uh, negotiate and celebrate uh, the variety and heterogeneity of the intangible cultural heritage in Singapore. Thank you very much.